Good afternoon. I would like to welcome you to the March 9th, 2021 meeting of the State Board of Education. We'll begin today with our Pledge of Allegiance led by Mr. Walters. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, <clears throat> Thank you. Our first item is the approval of our minutes for our last meeting. Are there any objections to approving the minutes as presented? Hearing none, those minutes are approved by unanimous consent. Our next item is the approval of today's agenda. Is there any objection to approving the agenda as presented? Hearing none, that agenda is approved by unanimous consent. I understand that we have some distinguished visitors with us today. Uh, I have three names, but I'm assuming that you're probably going to be introducing those, Madam Superintendent. So I'll hold off on that. Is there any media that we need to acknowledge? with us today. I don't see any. Well, welcome to our meeting, and we'll find out soon how, how we are going to be in recognition of you. How you doing? Good to see you. All right. I would like to welcome our newest member who just joined us today. This is Delaney Frierson. She's originally from Texas, but she is a resident of Manning, South Carolina, and she is replacing Dr. Sean Johnson as the representative for the Third Judicial Circuit. So, as I mentioned, she's from Clarendon County, and she has worked in Sumter II and Williamsburg in a number of roles, including business teacher, principal, and administrative district level in a number of roles in that category. She's recently retired after 39 years and remains active in supporting her Clarendon School District. So welcome, Ms. Frierson. Thank you. We're happy to have you. Uh, Dr. Woodall. Yes. And she also shared with me she has eight and a half grandchildren. <laughs> oh, you're going to have to clarify the half for us. Uh, I have a grandbaby who's... Okay. She's her sister's half-sister. All right. But well, she's, she's ours. Well, you and haven't gotten a rest in your retirement then between being active in the school district and eight and a half. <laughs> that keeps you busy, I'm sure. We welcome you into your service. It's an honor. It's a Thank pleasure. you so much. And now I'd like to turn it over to State Superintendent Spearman, who's going to tell us about our guest in the audience. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's great to see everyone today. Hope you've had a nice uh, month and we're about to spring and the new weather and we are in the process of getting our teachers and our support staff vaccinated across the state. So I think everyone, even though we still have our mask on, we're smiling underneath and there's a little light that we can really see now at the end of the tunnel. So. Uh, I, I can sense uh, excitement among our educators. I do want to let you know, this is how we stand today as far as our delivery model across the state. 1,267 schools, five of those are not on this chart because they are virtual online charter schools. Full face-to-face, -face, 847 of our schools are back five days a week. We have 406 that are in a hybrid. Many of those are four days a week and eight schools that are virtual. Uh, several of those are schools that at some point have been face-to-face, -face, but due to uh, outbreak among staff, they, they have to move back and forth. So this is the map. We don't have a single district uh, that is all virtual. That's the first time I can show you that since uh, a year ago. Uh, when everybody was all virtual. So we're, we're making progress and encouraging our districts to uh, get our children back into school. And I'll share with you again, uh, obviously, the data, uh, the research on how to manage the 
coronavirus in our school system has changed. We've learned so much, and now the data really show, the data really backs up children being back in school safely, particularly our elementary and middle schools. Um, and I think uh, our high schools probably will be some of the last ones who come back. And those students are adults, and uh, the transmission rate can be a little stronger there amongst those uh, high schoolers. So, but we're really, really proud, and we're really pushing our school board members and superintendents to offer a five-day-a-week plan for all students in South Carolina. Um, our special guest today, we have a program that our staff here at the department has supported and worked with for a number of years. It's called Schools to Watch. It is a middle school program um, by the National Forum to Accelerate Middle Grades Reform. And we're very, very excited here in our agency. All of this work goes under uh, Ms. Kim Mack's Office of School Transformation, and you all know Kim. You may not have met her uh, associates who work with her, LaToya Curry-Jones. LaToya, if you'd stand up so everybody can see you, and Tina Jamison, is Tina with us today, are the two staff members. And another person that we sort of claim, because uh, I've known him for a long time, he was, he was our state middle school principal of the year a few moons ago uh, in Indian land, I believe, right, David? Indian land, when, and I was there uh, to visit that area of the state. Certainly has changed since, uh, since that happened just a few years ago. And now it's with the Greenville County School Systems, David McDonald, Dr. McDonald, thank you for being here. And we want to honor four new South Carolina, four South Carolina middle schools have been newly named a schools to watch by this national forum. It means that they're just an all round great middle school and all the things that go with that. Academic excellence, developmentally responsive to the students, socially equitable, and they have great organization to, of support programs in their schools. We have a total of 29 of our middle schools in the states that have received this designation. They can be redesignated, and I'll share with you four principals who are here today under that status. But first of all, very special school that I love to honor because he served in this building as state superintendent, uh, Dr. Cyril B. Busby, Creative Arts Academy in Lexington District 2. The, uh, if we could go back, please, to that slide. Um, there we go. Uh, Principal Stephanie Hux. Stephanie? Stand up and uh, congratulations to Stephanie. I'll say it again because I think it's so important for us to be reminded of just how important it is to have an, a dynamic principal at a school. They can make or break it. You know, good leadership is the difference. And it starts, obviously, with elected school board members, and then their selection of a superintendent. I see J.R. Green's picture on the screen there, a great superintendent. But then the ability to have great principals at each school that can set the climate at their school. So hats off to these principals. I know this award is a team award, but I can promise you it will not happen if there's not a great principal in place. And secondly, from Northwest Middle School in our Greenville County School System principal, Patrick Jarrett. Patrick, please stand. There he is. Congratulations, Patrick. We appreciate what you've done at Northwest. And now we're again in uh, a huge system, the Greenville County Schools. Uh, Ralph Chandler Middle School, principal mm -hmm. Jeff Jenkins. Congratulations to Burke Royster for, for having this recognition up in Greenville and, and to David as well. And finally, from right here in Richland School District 2, Principal Tamala Ashford at Dent Middle School. It's a fantastic middle school over at Dent. And I know Randall Geary that was there for a number of years and, and put a lot of great things in place for you to follow. But uh, we appreciate you keeping that great leadership going. And now for the four principals who were redesignated as schools to watch from Spartanburg School District 1, 
T.E. Mabry Middle School, Principal Ty Dawkins. Ty? Thank you. And Ty was telling me he's been at the school, I believe, two years, but a principal for 11 years. So just getting good started. That's great. Uh, at R.H. Fulmer Middle School, again in Lexington School District 2, Principal Megan Carrero. Thank you. So proud of Fulmer Middle right here, right across the bridge from us. And back up to Spartanburg in Spartanburg District 1 at Landrum Middle School. Ron Garner is the superintendent there. Principal Tucker Hamrick. Tucker. <laughs> and finally, down in the Orrie County area, St. James Middle School, Principal Oga Tagus. Oga. <laughs> and we have a few other guests with us. Um, if y'all. Stan, any other guests who were with the principals today so we can recognize you. Thank you for coming along today. And uh, it's an honor to recognize this great leadership that's going on across our state. And we appreciate it, and we appreciate um, your extra work this last year. These eight principals uh, have all told me seven of them are back to school five days a week with their students. The last school will return uh, in another week or so for full five days a week. And they've told me that the students have been exceptional and that they're so happy to be back in school. They're working hard, behaving, doing what they're supposed to be doing. So we're glad to hear that and that all of their teachers uh, are in the process now of getting vaccinated uh, over the next few days or weeks. So. Um, Again, things are looking up, and I'm happy to give this report. I know we've got some special things on our agenda today. So that concludes my report, but I'll be happy to answer any questions that any member might have. Does anybody have any questions for Superintendent Spearman or any of our virtual participants? I don't think so. What Thank a fun you. report. We've missed our visitors yeah, yeah. and our and celebration. Right so and that's a smiling behind glimmer of hope to see everybody back. Yeah. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And our parliamentarian comment, Ms. Hazelwood. I don't want to call anyone out, but we still have <laughs> three folks who have not filed. Um, you know who you are. I'm not going to call names. Oh, come on. On the state board. <laughs> we also have two people who are not on the state board who still need to file. But the next time we're together, it will be too late. Oh. So if you need me, please Ooh. call me after uh, this meeting. Thank you. Five minutes. Yeah, thank you. That deadline does slip up, so thank you for that reminder. We do have someone who has expressed an interest in making some comments to the board. Mr. Bomer. We welcome you today to our meeting. Okay. Uh, we appreciate your interest, but please know that we we're hearing from you for the first time, so yes. all we can do is listen, and then we can follow up with questions later. And we have a five-minute time limit, but we certainly are interested in what you bring to us today so that we can follow up later if needed. Thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you so much for having me again. I appreciate the time to make a public comment. Uh, I come to you. My name is Judson Bomer. <coughs> I'm from... Greenville, South Carolina, and my son is a senior at J.O. Mann High School. Everybody hear me good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Get closer to the, yeah. We're close to the mic? Okay. Uh, as I said, my name is Justin Bomer. My son is Alexander Bomer. Uh, he and two of his other teammates, William Henderson and John Lombrell, were deemed academically ineligible this year for the spring sports lacrosse, which has just started. They've missed six of their games. They've got 11 left. I started an appeals process in Greenville uh, for their academic ineligibility. I started with the AD at J.O. Mann High School, the principal at J.O. Mann High School, <clears throat> the AD for the county, uh, Mr. Nance, and then I spoke to the Greenville County School Board two weeks ago. So the, the, the question is, they're, they're seniors at J.O. Mann. They only passed three of the four classes they took last semester the first semester of senior year, that deemed them academically ineligible. These three boys 
are currently honor students at J.O. Mann. They have an outstanding academic past. J.O. Mann has done a great job with, with their students in, in academics. Uh, but yet they are deemed academically ineligible. Um, they did pass four courses in the fall as required by the, uh, did not pass four courses in the fall as required by the South Carolina High School League. So since February 4th, February 2nd, they were told they were on the team. February 4th, they were told they were not on the team. I told you I'd spoken with an AD at Man who replied, Judd, I'm a first year AD and this is the rule. Then I talked to the principal who also replied, they didn't pass four classes, this is the rule. I talked to Greenville County School Board. They have to pass at least four classes, Judd. This is the rule. I understand what they're telling me. I'm questioning the rule doesn't make sense. That's what I'm questioning. I reached out to the South Carolina High School uh, League, and I, it was a very simple question. For a child who has academically not been ahead, take seven courses. He can fail three courses and still play his senior year. My son took four courses, English 101 composition, Greenville Tech, to go to college, to get ahead. AP environmental science, to go to college, to get ahead. Um, calculus honors, to get ahead. And the only course he needed to graduate was government and econ. That's the only one course he needed to graduate, that's it. Last semester, he had the F in English 101, and I'm not discounting that. Um, that's his first F ever, ever. Prior to, from the seventh grade up, he's only had two C's. That devastated him. He's retaking that course to try to make sure he can do what he needs to do. I feel like that this rule that is being applied to those boys is not being applied correctly. I really feel that way, and I can't get anyone to explain to me why or go through the appeals process. My AD would not go through the appeals process for me. My <clears throat> principal wouldn't go through the appeals process for me. So I'm the only one that's got to speak on these kids' behalf. If their grades weren't so exceptional, I wouldn't have a fight. Their grades are exceptional. They have not failed academically to be ineligible. Just to give you a feel for it, Junior year, Alexander, English Honors 4, 95. Speech, 93. AP Biology, 92. AP U.S. History, 86. AP Statistics, 80. Marketing, 100. These, all, three of the, all three of these kids have performed the way they need to. All, I really, all I'm really asking, I'm just asking one thing. I look at his GPA and it's a 4325 weight in the 3462 on a 4 -0 scale. He's getting into Hampton, Sydney, the Citadel, Darlemore School of Business, Clemson, yet he's academically ineligible. It's, that's just not making sense. I can't, I can't say it enough. So realizing this is public comment, my request is one thing. Please have someone look at this rule. I've almost come to the realization, he's come to the realization that it's not gonna change with him. It needs to change for the next guy. Someone needs to look at this. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Thank you for giving me the, the opportunity to speak to you. Um, again, I hope I hope I made sense. Um, I hope it made sense on behalf of these boys. If nobody else is going to speak on their behalf, I just wanted to sing their praises. I wanted to sing the praises of uh, J. O. Mann and Greenville County Academics. It really, I'm really excited. They do a great job. And Thank do, you. Do appreciate everything you guys do. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us today. Moving into our committee reports. Um, this morning, our policy and legislative committee heard one item for approval. That was from Greenwood County 52. It's a waiver for request um, not to monitor seat time because they are going to a mastery based approach there. That item has been placed on the consent agenda for your review later. And an information item that we received came from Ori County, and that one involved an extension for submitting their renewal plan. And that has been honored by Superintendent Spearman. It, again, was just an item of information to let us know about it. Our next committee report um, comes from Mr. English. 
And that is for educator professions. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have um, two action items um, from our committee. The first one is um, referring to the current policy regarding the PRC was approved by the um, SBE on January the 8th, 2014. The revised policy updates membership to include three non-voting ex officio members of the PRC to provide subject matter expertise, serve in an advisory capacity, and participate in all meetings and discussion. And that is the summary of our first action item. Okay. Thank you. Our second action item um, from our committee is um, uh, policy is a replacement policy. This policy replaces provisions in the 2012 guidelines related to the National Council for the accreditation of teacher education processes and decisions with those consistent with the Council for the Accreditation of Educator Preparedness and current accreditation organization. And those are our two action items. Would you like me to go on with the other two? Yeah, please. All that right. was your numbers, right? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have two um, information items. The first one is the report presents employment and performance evaluation data for the American Board candidates issued an alter alternative route cert certificate during the 2019-2020 academic year, the most recent year for which um, complete information is available. And from that, we did get 103 teachers certified through that process. The second information item, this report rep uh, rep uh, presents employment and performance evaluation data for teachers of tomorrow candidates issued by an alternative route certification during the 2019-2020 academic year. The most recent year for which um, complete information is available and ni 94 teachers were certified on this. And so those are our two information items and we place um, EP01 and EP02 on the consent agenda. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Mr. English about the committee work? All right, hearing none, I would turn it over to Ms. Stapleton, who is representing the Standards Learning and Accountability Committee. Thank you. This morning, we did have one approval item presented to the Standards Learning and Accountability Committee. And that one approval item, Dr. Ann Presley, Director of the Office of Standards and Learning, Division of College and Career Readiness, presented the South Carolina College and Career Ready Science Standards 2021. Dr. Presley introduced Ms. Gwendolyn Sheely, Education Associate in the Office of Standards and Learning, Division of College and Career Readiness, to provide a report. And Ms. Sheely reported that there were over 500 people involved in revising the South Carolina Carolina College and Career Ready Science Standards. She provided the timeline of the standards development and the writing team ran and studied the entire research base of the framework for K-12 science education prior to the revisions. Ms. Sheely also reported that the full revision process was a statewide approach and she reported on the representation of the committee members and the increase of members from 2014 to 2021. She provided a list of business and industry, state department, college and university, and informal educators to show the community's involvement throughout the revision process. <clears throat> Ms. Sheely also reported on the South Carolina Department of Education and Education Oversight Committee review recommendations based on their full review of the science standards. We have placed approval of the first reading of the South Carolina College and Career Ready Science Standards for 2021 on the consent agenda for today. We also had one information item presented to the committee, and Dr. Sarah Longshore, Director of the Office of Federal and State Accountability, Division of Federal Programs Accountability and School Improvement, and also Mrs. Susan Murphy, Education Associate with the Office of Federal and State Accountability, shared with us regarding the WIDA English Language Development Standards Framework Readoption. The WIDA English Language Development Standards Framework provides the basis for instruction and assessment for multilingual learners in kindergarten through grade 12. The WIDA ELD standards align with the required annual English proficiency, language proficiency assessment, the accountability system, and incoming multilingual learners identification. The framework is asset-based and focuses on the contributions that the multilingual learners bring to our communities. The framework consisted of four components. The WIDA ELD standard statements, key language usage, 
language expectations, and proficiency level descriptors. And these components are essential, of course, in fostering the language development for our multilingual <coughs> learners. So we appreciated them sharing with, with us the information on that framework for readoption. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Ms. Stapleton? Thank you again for that report. Now, Mr. Uh, Chairlet Walters, will you talk to us about the education licensure work? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the uh, ratification agenda was approved in the full board uh, meeting earlier today. We had 12 cases before the committee. Uh, 11 were orders of suspension, and there was one order of revocation. And I'd also like to note that none of those cases were COVID-related. Thank you so much. And in the full board educator licensure committee, as you mentioned, we did ratify the work of your committee. We also heard one permanent revocation case um, and did approve that. So the next thing we need to consider is our consent agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the items that have been placed on the consent agenda for so review? Moved. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second to review the consent agenda today. That again is from the Policy and Legislative Committee, Greenwood County District 52's request for exemption for um, the seat time. Under educator professionals, it is the educator preparation guidelines, their standards, policies, procedures, and PRC work. Also, the South Carolina Educator Profession Guidelines for State Accreditation. Under the Standards and Learning Committee, we have the Science Standards First Reading. So, all in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Do we have any opposition? The consent agenda passes. So under information items, we have some reports today. The first one is Dr. Mathis with our literacy update. Thank you, Dr. Woodall, and I trust you can hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, today's report uh, and update will focus on uh, two brief areas. One is the approval of our reading coaches that are vital to the success of our literacy programs across the state. The South Carolina Department of Education has the authority to approve reading coaches in schools with one third or more of third graders scoring and does not meet on the 2019 administration of the South Carolina Ready ELA assessment. The department identified the schools that have one third or more of third graders and does not meet as the Palmetto Literacy Project schools using performance data from 2018 and 2019 um, and their performance on the South Carolina ELA uh, assessment. Due to the cancellation of the SC Ready in 2020, Tier 2 and Tier 3 schools identified as having uh, one third or more of their third graders scoring and does not meet will remain the same as last year. The department will coordinate with districts to approve reading coaches in Tier 2 and in Tier 3 schools which includes schools with 33.3 uh, or more percent of the third graders scoring and does not meet. This includes primary schools that feed into the elementary schools as well. Tier two schools are identified as having 33.3 to 49.9% of third graders scoring does not meet on the 2019 SC Ready ELA assessment. Tier three schools are identified as having 50% or more of their third graders scoring does not meet on the 2019 ELA um, reading assessment. Districts with tier one schools, which have fewer than 33.3% and does not meet, um, will be allowed flexibility to use their allocation for continued support of the reading coach, utilizing reading interventionist or professional development that meets the specific literacy needs of the school. Districts will, in this process, will be provided with the following support documents. And I'll say when you receive this information, your minutes, uh, there'll be links to the documents. But one is the literacy specialist job description. 
a plan for tiered support that districts can use as a reference, a document of clarifying the coach's role, and another guidance document for hiring an effective reading coach. Recommendations uh, of reading coaches are due to the department by May 15th, and the Office of Early Learning and Literacy will review and uh, approve or reject the recommendations by May 30th, 2021. Considering our academic recovery plans, during the February State Board meeting, you heard from um, a presentation from Education Analytics on the potential growth and predictions of our, uh, predictions of performance using interim assessments. Education Analytics has provided each district with a preliminary spreadsheet of the historical and current year test data to analyze when developing their ELA and math academic recovery plans. Those uh, files were sent to school districts last Friday. Preliminary data includes files from NWEA, STAR, and iReady. Once files are received from CASE TE21 and Reading and Math Inventory, final file data files will be sent to districts. And at that time, a deadline for submitting plans to the department will be uh, made available with the final data files. Dr. Woodall, that completes my report. Thank you so much. What questions does anybody have for Dr. Mathis? No questions. Thank you, Dr. Mathis. Kimberly Mack is with us. Good afternoon. Oh, hello. And we are interested in your updates on Allendale, Florence, and Williamsburg. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to share. In Allendale School District, students are currently attending school four days a week face-to-face. -face. The district will transition to five days a week beginning March 29th, 2021. The Allendale County Hospitals partnered with the district to administer the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine to district employees on March 16th, 2021. And the district held iReady professional development for teachers and administrator, administrators to review winter diagnostic data and develop next steps to improve student reading and math skills. In Florence School District 4, the district is preparing to trans transition students from four days a week face-to-face um, to a five day a week model. And McLeod Health is partnering with Florence Board to provide COVID-19 vaccines to staff on March 23rd, 2021. And in Williamsburg County School District, a King Street Middle Magnet School student tied for first place in the state spelling bee. The students have had the option to attend classes five days a week, face to face all school year in Williamsburg County School District. Um, and they are encouraging more students to come. And the district has partnered with MUSC to provide COVID-19 vaccines to the staff. They provided the vaccines on multiple days for staff according to the state's vaccination plan. This concludes my report. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions for uh, Ms. Mack? We do have a comment from Superintendent Spearman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I did want to just add uh, a comment or two about, and, and uh, Ms. Mack, had you finished your entire report? I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am, I okay. finished. All right, I, I wanted to be sure. Um, I did want the board members to know and uh, have a chance to question me if you have uh, any thoughts about uh, a letter that I did send to the parents, staff, parents, and community of Timmonsville and Florence County Tuesday of last week. Uh, I had told you really over the years as we have talked about the best step forward for Timmonsville that we were very concerned about the size of the districts, one of the smallest districts in the state with approximately 660 students in the entire district. Um, we have done very well there managing, but even with us uh, shared services, even with us contracting with other districts to run the district office administration, it is extremely difficult to make ends meet and to run a quality program with the opportunities that those students really need, like those that students nearby are getting. 
So I had been contemplating and had announced back in the fall that we would probably go ahead with the consolidation of Florence 4 into Florence 1 and the closure of Timmonsville High School beginning July 1 of this year. The community in one of the meetings asked me to please consider waiting and giving some more time and uh, some had come to me privately to ask that. Some had met with the principal at the school. She relayed that information to me. I discussed with the legislative delegation and decided to wait. And the letter that went out on Tuesday announced the consolidation of Florence 4 and Florence 1 beginning July 1 of 2022. There would dissolve uh, the Florence 4 board the high school students, the high school would be closed and those students would select a high school to attend in Florence One. The other two schools, the elementary school and middle school would remain in operation there in Timmonsville. That would give us a uh, part of a very, very nice building to use for whatever the community deems most appropriate. We're looking at a early childhood center, some type of sports recreation program for students, and that I would be naming a transition committee shortly. And we're in the process now of putting those names together. So I wanted to let you know that if you have any questions, uh, those, are, those are the details that we have immediately. If you have any questions about that, I'd be happy to answer those. Yes. Madam Chair, I just have one question. I'm just interested in, in, to what they thought more time was going to accomplish. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think as far as the, the opposition really seems to be more uh, headed to, uh, or at the, cons the closure of the high school. The consolidation of the district, uh, they seem to understand and, and really see the benefit of that. How many students were in the high school? The high school has about 167 students in the entire high school. Four grades? Or yes, sir, four grades. So 35 to 40 students in each class. Um, the, the folks who talk with me, uh, and, I, and I appreciate this, that you know, there is a legacy. Uh, they wanted to retire the school appropriately throughout the year with the, you know, with homecoming, with the the seniors having time to know, and really this gives us time for the junior class students and even possibly sophomore students who might want to go ahead and take more courses and graduate early over the summer and during the year next year. You know, some students have conveyed, I just really want my high school diploma to say Timsville High School, which, you know, I, I do understand that. So that was basically the reason. Mr. Brennan, just uh, sentimental, traditional no, no, kinds of okay. things. Thank you. And, and, and at the same time, I had to consider the availability, the, the reality of how this was going to affect Florence One. Florence One, uh, the two high schools that are closest to Timmonsville are very crowded. Uh, West Florence and South, Side, South Florence High School both are very crowded. And the board there, the superintendent, they are looking at what they need to do to build and add on to their classroom space in order to really have appropriate space, uh, particularly now with the pandemic for their own students. They're crowded now with their own students and to bring in a few more students adds to that issue. So this gives them a little more time to be ready to accept the students in, with adequate classroom space. All right, Mr. Walters. <clears throat> Would uh, rising freshmen, for instance, have the opportunity to go to their new school this year rather than wait for them? Well, those are the kinds of questions that I think the transition committee needs to work together to set that. And, and the, uh, the next question is, well, are they going to have the choice of choosing which high school they want to go to, or is it going to be some attendance line drawn? Those are questions that I would like to work very closely with um, the transition committee. And I think there, sh there will be good representation from Florence 1 and 4, and particularly advocates on the committee to represent the students at Timmonsville High School to make sure they're treated 
uh, welcomed and, and that they have the best opportunity, but at the same time, with respect to Florence One, because they're the ones who are gonna have to accept and do all this really hard work. So there will be adequate representation from both sides to make those kind of decisions. Any other questions? I just have one. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Cabral. What kind of, thank you. What kind of additional travel time would that in, in yes, suit for those students? That's a great question, Mr. Krabowski. The, the, as the crow flies from Timmonsville High School into the city limits and the location of those schools, it's about seven miles, give or take. Uh, and obviously, some students may even live closer because there's a, you know, there's a land area, a land mass area between the city of the little town of Timmonsville and the location of these schools. It does not appear that that would be really any huge challenge or add, may add right. a little bit, but I think it's within reasonable range. Thank you very much. That was a, not much of a distance at all then. Yes, sir. Relatively. It's very close. Any other and, questions? And secondly, yes, I have a couple of questions. Uh, this is this is J.R. Green, uh, Superintendent Spearman. I appreciate that update. Uh, I am a little familiar with that area. Uh, so you said seven miles. You're talking about from Timmonsville to where would be seven miles before I get into my question? Well, I think of it seven miles back into the city, town, city limits of Florence. The exact school, the, the two closest schools, and and we have looked at a bullet map of where the families actually live and which school is the closest. Um, the school that's the closest for the majority of students is West Florence. It, however, is also the most crowded school. Uh, Southside, about um, a third of the students, I guess, live closest to Southside. So we've gone back and forth and a decision has not been made. And again, this has to involve, I think, the, the superintendent and the Florence One board members and, and a real discussion on, is it, they do not currently have open choice for other students in Florence One. They do have an IB program at Wilson High School, which is the farthest away, which has a lot of space. <laughs> so I'm, I'm hoping that that choice would be available to these Timmonsville students as they become a part of Florence One if they wanted to go to an IB program. But that is the only choice that students in Florence One currently have. Otherwise, they attend their closest school by, by where, they're, where they live. So we've got some decisions that need to be made. And this gives us a little bit of time to work on that. But the capacity has been the issue. But I can tell you that um, there are some uh, building plans that are underway right now uh, to, that would alleviate this. And plus, already at Southside High School, they have some changes going on there, opening up uh, some classroom space there that should be available by August of 22. I can get the exact so, knowledge for you, Dr. Green. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't really have that, but that's, that's how it looks on the map. And honestly, there are a few students who are closer to Lamar <laughs> that might live out on that far edge. Uh, so, but, but generally speaking, the closest school is West Florence with a few students who the closest school is South Florence. I appreciate that. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, you know, the first thing that jumps out at me, and you know, I was have been reading the reports as well, uh, is representation for uh, for families in that area uh, as relates to the governance structure. And you know, this is unlike a traditional consolidation, if you will, and probably more like an acquisition. Uh, how, how you know what's the conversation relative to? how those families still have a voice in the operation uh, of what will now be their new district. And I should have mentioned that. That is actually another reason for the delay. As you know, the census report is coming to the state legislature sometime late summer, September-ish, 
Uh, they've been delayed on that. Ordinarily, they would be working on reapportionment right now, but the census data is a little late. So we are going through the process now of redrawing all lines, which would include redrawing school board lines. Uh, so as, as that is done, the Timmonsville community will be considered in that drawing of the attendance uh, of the map for representation on the Florence School Board, Florence One School Board. So some, some um, maybe all, school board members' areas might change, but they will be folded into that for, so that they will have a vote and representation on the Florence One School Board. But it, may, it is my intention as far as the transition committee that they be represented on this transition committee. It, 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 and part of my, my, my final comment, uh, Superintendent Spearman, is that you know I'm always a little concerned um, that, that, that whomever receives these students embraces them as their own. And, uh, and you know, I think there's always uh, a bit of anxiety, uh, if you will, from the, uh, from the families in that community uh, that they will be uh, sent somewhere, assigned someplace uh, who aren't necessarily embracing them uh, as one of their own. And, uh, and, and so I, I think we should always be sensitive to that fact and, and ensure uh, that rather it's West Florence or South Florence, uh, that, that, that we ensure that they aren't necessarily viewed as, uh, as a burden, uh, but, but viewed as someone that they, they we're excited about receiving. And I'm not suggesting that anyone has said that. Uh, I, I'm just saying that I, I recognize that there is uh, likely some anxiety that some people in that community uh, are experiencing. Yes, sir. I couldn't agree with you more. And I will tell you, the as I have spoken um, privately with the Florence One school board members, the administration there, they have assured me that they will do everything possible to welcome these students. And as I said, I think it's important for those students to have an advocate for the next, during the transition and probably for the next few years that someone, if there is an issue, that someone that would be designated that they know, love, and trust that would be involved with the, with the district that they can go to. So that is my intention there. But thank you for always keeping reminding me of that. I, I, I agree with you. I think I heard multiple voices. Are there other questions? Um, Ray Kabrowski again. Okay. I just uh, wanted to second those remarks and, and maybe as an example to look at, we had a similar thing in Charleston County when Lincoln High School closed and and had a and absorbed the students at Wando. And I know they worked very hard in that, and they may be a role model to, to look at. Yes, sir. Thank you. And if I may, and secondly, Madam Chair, I wanted to also fill you in. Uh, last Friday, I went down to Williamsburg County Schools and visited uh, some of the facilities there with Dr. Wilder and the members of the delegation, Senator Saab and Representative McKnight. We particularly looked at three facilities. Uh, King Street High School, which actually has two facilities on either side, uh, the East Campus and the West Campus, nine and 10th graders, 11 and 12th graders. That facility was built for 1,500 students. It currently has about 500 students, 550 students. So there's a lot of space. Uh, one side is, was built back in the 1970s. The other campus was built in the 1990s, um, pro the newest. We also then went over to Greeleyville to visit C.E. Murray Middle and High School. That campus was built back in the 1950s. Old facility needs a lot of work. Has a new, brand new gymnasium. Uh, and then we toured Greeleyville Elementary, which is a K-5 site. Uh, newer facility, one of the newest in the county, but very crowded. A uh, tiny little cafeteria, no space for meetings um, where all the student body can come together. 
Dr. Wilder has proposed as we are looking at how do we leave this district in the best shape possible? What do we need to do? She has proposed and worked with some of her staff on a restructuring plan that would, would close um, C.E. Murray High School. And again, that's about um, 10, 15 minutes. I don't have the details yet because we're not as far as along about Mr. Krabowski, if you ask me about the distance, but it took us about 15 minutes to get over there. Uh, and obviously students live in between, but to close C.E. Murray, C.E. Murray has about 100, uh, le a little less than 200 students at the high school. Um, they would go to King Street which has adequate space for them. And um, Greeley, her proposal is to move the upper grades of Greeleyville Elementary then over to C.E. Murray Middle in high school. I had asked uh, Jasmine Shaw, who's the director of facilities, to go down and begin looking at the facilities. Quite honestly, there is, uh, at least in her opinion, there's so much work that would have to be done to build up that old facility at C. Murray that really a new school needs to be built there. Um, and then there are other issues, there are other ideas too. So we are in the process now of looking at that, of coming up with a plan. We have not made a final decision. I can tell you that at one time there was a push that maybe this would happen for the next school year. I really don't see that happening. I think that we're gonna to have to allow the CE Murray to operate another year as, as a high school, kind of stay where we are, because there's a lot of facility work and a lot of planning that will have to go in. But I am taking in all the information right now, working. Um, and, and the second issue is they don't have the money there <laughs> to build a school. And so I am in the process of approaching the state legislature that it is way past time that our state legislature does something to help with rural buildings for the infrastructure needs in our rural and our poorest counties where they could raise their taxes 300 mills and still only get money to put on a roof. They just do not have the capability of building money. So I, I'm working on that. Uh, that's gonna take a while, but I just wanted to keep you up to date because that has been announced in the press but um, I, I'm, trying to, I'm going through this very thoughtfully and again, always trying to get these districts in a good spot for when we do leave as a state and they are under their own leadership, if there are decisions that have to be made that are really tough decisions uh, for the future, I'm willing to go ahead and get them on solid ground before we leave. Thank you, any other questions about Williamsburg? Thank you, Superintendent. Mr. Strother, will you come and fill us in on the work in Clarendon? Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board, Superintendent Spearman, thank you for having me. I'll give you an update on the financial management takeover of Clarendon One School District, which happened back in October the 15th of 2020. And when that happened, I previously reported that uh, we had about $1.3 million of liabilities that needed to be paid to the uh, IRS, to the retirement system, the South Carolina Department of Revenue. And th those were contributing to the financial takeover. And we also had an, another liability, which was a TAN coming due in April. Uh, with those things, we reported that there was about a $2.3 million cash deficit as of June 30th, 2021. So, it's quite a situation that we needed to jump on quickly and take care of. Since that time, the uh, South Carolina Retirement System liability has been paid in full. That was roughly around $800,000 that's been paid in full. The IRS obligation has been paid in full around $425,000. And the South Carolina Department of Revenue has been paid in full. That was around $125,000 liability. So those are the liabilities that contributed to the decision to do a financial management takeover on the district. Um, with the most recent cash flow information provided uh, by Mr. Lodeholt, who is the contract CFO that the State Department put in place down in Clarendon One, he provided a cash flow analysis uh, as of February, end of February 2021, the cash flow deficit now 
um, began around 2.3 million, I believe, and is now reported at $153,000. So quite a significant decrease in that deficit, so we're proud to say. So currently, the situation there is we're continuing the spending freeze. The spending freeze in a, is in effect, reducing the accounts payable costs quite significantly. I think I saw a drop of about $100,000 between last month and this month. Any open positions are not being filled. Uh, some of the open positions that, you know, where savings have occurred an assistant, super special service, uh, assistant superintendent of special services retired uh, back in November, and Clarendon 3 is covering the services for um, a stipend from Clarendon 1. Transportation between the two districts uh, consolidated around January of 2021. There's a vacant HR position which remains unfilled, and those are being shared with Clarendon 4. A Medicaid clerk position became open and will not be filled. And a music teacher uh, position became open. So uh, Clarendon, too, is sharing those services so that the students can still benefit from those music services. And then finally, the Clarendon 1 superintendent will be furloughed the last 10 days of June. So there's a furlough in effect for the Clarendon 1 superintendent. Other, other items that we are currently working on is the department, uh, with the assistance of Mr. Lodeholt, has identified expenses that can be transferred or shifted from some of the CARES ESSER funds. And we are uh, in the process of sharing, uh, shifting those expenditures. Any measures to help reduce the deficit are continually being discussed. We're currently searching anything that can be uh, utilized to help us reduce that deficit even further. Um, some members of the finance office, we are going down once a week and we're uh, currently working on federal claims. Um, in other words, uh, any federal money that has been spent is uh, spent ahead of time and the, and the district uses its own cash. So none of, the, none of those funds have been claimed back for the district. So we're going down and making sure those claims are getting done to help bring that cash back to the district. So. It's so one thing we're working on, and we uh, hope to have that uh, done and have a handle on that very, very shortly. And then also, we are, uh, I, I increased my team member by one person. We're going to go down and assure that the FY20 audit gets completed, because that has not been completed yet. So we're going to go down this week and begin work on that uh, 20 audit, getting trial balances done, and everything in shape for those auditors to come in and complete, uh, complete that audit. So... We want to make sure that is done as well. Uh, the Clarendon Board, Trusted, Board of Trustees is being updated once a month, and of course I'm updating you all once a month. Um, and that concludes my presentation, so if there are any questions regarding what I've reported, you know, feel free to ask. We're happy to hear that good news. I think Mr. Walters had a question. Yeah, just a quick one. Did, did that district receive ESSER funds? Yes. Yes, they've received ESSER, and they will receive ESSER two funds as well. So. Yes. Any other questions for Mr. Schultz? I have a question. Okay, Dr. Downs. Um, I am curious, the uh, Medicaid clerk position that's not being filled, how is that going to be handled? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if those services are being shared with, an, with the, uh, uh, another part of the district, but the Medicaid will be taken care of, that claiming will be taken care of, it's assured, and, I, and I'll find that out for you, exactly how that's being done to make sure those, those Medicaid funds are being claimed. Thank you, Dr. Downs. Any other questions? Clear, okay, Clearing in Three is sharing those, sharing those services with Clearing in Three, so. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, Mr. Strother. Thank you. Do we have any other business? If not, please remember to give Noel any forms that you need to turn in before you leave, and we will see you next month. I declare us adjourned. <laughs>